Hey guys, welcome to Bedtime Fairy Fails. I'm Kim. Before I start the show, I just wanted to say that next week is Thanksgiving, so all of us here at Bedtime Fairy Fails will be stuffing ourselves with turkey and delicious food, so we won't have an episode next week. But don't worry, we'll be back the week after with more hilarious stories to share with you. I also wanted to say that we really appreciate our listeners, and thanks for giving us such a great kickoff. If you want to support the show, the best thing you can do is leave us reviews on Apple, share us with your friends, and encourage your friends to send in stories. We can always use more stories. They don't have to be incredibly detailed. I'll add all that in myself. Just send us your basic, what happened, how did you fail, or how you miraculously succeeded. Whichever. I'll ask for details if I need them. But don't be afraid to send in a story just because you don't know if it's that funny. Don't worry. We'll make it funny. Now, on to the show. This first story tonight was sent in by Shava the Tooth Fairy. This is a tale that teaches us that spiking your party member's drink is a terrible idea. It can lead to things like hot shirtless men, courtrooms, and some really awkward mornings. This is Judge Georgie. Once upon a time, there is a group of adventurers who found a mystery potion. Now this is pretty common to find in D&D and actually one of my favorite things. I love mystery anything in D&D, but we're not talking about me. We're talking about Georgie, an albino tiefling ranger who was also a high priestess of the Raven Queen and a self-appointed goddess. She had a bit of a narcissism issue. After the party acquires this mystery potion, no one volunteers to drink it. Go figure. So, before bed, the lightning monk named Iron and his best friend, an heir Genasi monk called Aurelia, decided to spike Georgie's drink with said mystery potion. A decision they would soon come to regret. Georgie drinks up and nothing happens. The monk besties wait and wait and wait. Nothing. So finally, they chalk it up to being nothing or a delayed effect and all but two party members go to sleep. Suddenly, the party finds themselves in a small quaint village full of peasants. Only the sleeping party members are present though. You see, the potion Georgie drank causes any creature sleeping within a thousand feet of her to enter her dreams. Dreams that she is completely in control of. The party wanders around the village for a while, finding nothing out of the norm, and having no idea they are just innocent, and some not so innocent, bystanders in Georgie's deepest, darkest fantasies. Just as the party begins to discuss what could possibly be going on, they hear a commotion. The villagers are all lining the streets and cheering like they're about to meet the king himself. They all turn to look and see a gorgeous, ornate carriage being drawn by some of the most majestic horses they have ever seen. But then they notice something strange. As the carriage passes the onlookers, they're changing. The once adoring fans are transforming before their very eyes into hot, muscly, shirtless men. Baby, you barbarian, because your style is all the way. What you doing after work? I'm going to need some fire resistance because you hot, girl. Hey, girl, what's your AC? Because I'd like to hit that. Generic appropriate cat call. The group is even more confused now. They move in closer to the edge of the street, hoping to find some answers. They push through the Chippendale-esque crowd to find out who's in the carriage. And they see, you guessed it, Georgie. The sorcerer called Aishka rolls his eyes. Of course it's Georgie. So full of herself. He grabs a handful of trash off the ground and throws it over the sexy crowd directly at her head. Georgie yells, Stop the carriage! She opens the door and stands over the crowd in her beautiful flowing gown and says, Who threw that? She scans the crowd and notices some of the party. 
which wasn't hard since they were the only people there who weren't hot shirtless men. She locks eyes with the sorcerer who quickly points at the dragon monk. She raises her hand, points a long ring-laden finger at him and says, You! You will stand trial for what you've done. The monk looks at the sorcerer and says, What the hell, man? Suddenly, the world around them begins to change. The village begins to fade, and in its place, a full courtroom appears, complete with gallows and a jury consisting of, yep, hot shirtless men. Georgie, who is seated in an elaborate throne overlooking the entire courtroom, also conjured dream copies of the two party members who weren't asleep. One dream copy party member was a drow girl named Shava, who was a proxy judge. The other, a half-orc woman named Magnar, and she was set as bailiff. Iron the monk suddenly found himself in shackles on the witness stand. Court was officially in session. All rise for the Honorable Judge Shava. Iron, you are charged with assaulting the beautiful and completely perfect goddess Georgie. What say you in your defense? I didn't throw anything. Aishka did. And what proof do you have to offer? What? This is insane! I watched him do it, and so did Aurelia! Iron's best friend shouts from the crowd, It's true! I watched Aishka throw the trash, then blame Iron! Aishka, the real trash thrower, yells out, You can't trust either of them! They're best friends! Of course they're gonna cover for each other! The court erupts in excited murmurs, until the judge bangs her gavel loudly. Order! Order in this court! One more outburst like that, and I'll see you all hanged. Iron, do you have any other evidence of your innocence? What happened to innocent until proven guilty? You're taking his word that I threw it. Why won't you take mine that I didn't? If you have no further evidence to provide, I ask the jury to deliver their verdict. The sexy jury whispers seductively among themselves for a couple of moments before one of them passes a paper to Judge Shava. Iron, the court finds you guilty of assault against the almighty Georgie. I hereby sentence you to death. Magna, escort him to the noose, and may God have mercy on your soul. Are you serious? Magnar takes Iron by the arm and begins leading him up the stairs to the dream gallows. All the while, Iron continues screaming about his innocence. The other party members also begin screaming and trying to run and help, but they find themselves frozen and unable to move. Georgie smirks down at them from her throne. Magnar places the noose around Iron's neck and tightens it. She asks Iron if he has any last words. Yeah, I do. Screw you, Georgie! Magnar puts the bag over Iron's head and places her hand on the lever. Then, Georgie stands up and says, Stop! I want to do it. She makes her way down to the gallows, pauses to smile at the rest of the party, then pulls the lever. The floor drops out from under Iron, and then... everyone wakes up. To say this caused some tension in the party is an understatement. Something about trying to put your fellow party members to death puts a bit of a strain on the friendships. But Georgie didn't let it get her down. She knew how amazing she was, and that's all that matters. The end. Our second story tonight was sent in by Tanya E. in Georgia. I'm about to tell you a terrifying tale full of terror. Just terror. This is Half Pint Horrors. Once upon a time, there was a small party of heroes. And I mean actually small. The party consisted of a gnome warlock named Graylin, a dwarf barbarian named Tonka, and a halfling bard named Findle. And this party had been sent to retrieve a powerful relic that was hidden somewhere in a very big and very old abandoned castle. The heroes had been warned that this relic had a terrifying effect. Literally. The closer you get to the relic, the more afraid you feel. No one actually knows what it looks like because everyone who has tried to retrieve it has failed. The overwhelming fear is just too much. But not our heroes. 
They're brave, they're strong, they're determined. The party enters through the old wooden doors. Even though it's midday, the castle is dark and gloomy. Tattered curtains hang over the windows and broken furniture lays here and there still partially covered by yellowed sheets. The party begins searching, paying close attention to how afraid they are and making jokes about Bindle screaming like a little girl when they find it. They search the dungeon and the main floor with no issues. Then they head up to the third floor. As they climb the stairs, there's a subtle shift in the party's mood. The jokes stop and there's a tense silence between the party members. By the time they reach the top of the stairs, everyone is feeling a little on edge. This must be where the relic is hidden. The group starts heading down the long, winding corridor and begins checking rooms. The party gets more and more anxious the further down the hallway they go. About three doors down, they open the door to a particularly dark room and peer inside nervously. The party looks across the room and sees three dark figures in the corner. The barbarian grabs her great axe and goes running across the room. At the same time, one of the three dark figures comes running towards her as well. She swings her axe in perfect unison with the other figure. The axes collide with a crash. Tonka finds herself standing in front of a full-length, shattered mirror. She laughs awkwardly and says, <laughs> Whoops. Guess we're getting closer. The heroes close the door on the broken mirror and continue down the hall. When they come to the next door, they all hesitate. No one moves to open it. Finally, Findle the Bard says, Graylin, open it. The warlock replies, Why me? Tonka chimes in with, What? Are you scared, Graylin? Relic getting to you? No. Snaps Graylin. He takes a deep breath, opens the door, and peeks inside with one eye. The other two hold their breath in anticipation. Then, Graylin lets out a scream and slams the door. <coughs> the other two jump back and ask him what he saw. It was the biggest rat I've ever seen. The other two laugh. Wow, Graylin. A rat? Laughs Tonka. Well, you're the one that attacks your own reflection, idiot says the warlock. The party continues slowly down the hallway, peeking through keyholes and jumping at the sound of their echoing footsteps. Our once brave heroes are quickly becoming afraid of their own shadows. No one is laughing anymore, though. They all struggle to keep their breathing even as they discuss how terrifying the end tables are. Finally, they reach the end of the hallway. The party is literally shaking with terror now. Everyone is afraid to open the door. The party doesn't know how to proceed from here. So the bard takes it upon himself to do something. He's got to remind them who they are and what they came for. Guys, guys, we must not let this paltry relic halt our quest. Yes, this room is frightening. Yes, it brings chills to my very soul, but we must be brave. Just like that time we met Graylin's wife. Yes, her disfigured complexion was like staring into the depths of the underworld. Did we run? Did we scream? No! Now go in there, grab that relic, look Graylin's wife right in the face, and say, I am not afraid! <laughs> The party slams the door, runs back down the hall, down the stairs, and out the front door. And they never spoke of this again. The end. Thanks for listening. To submit a fail, email me at bedtimefairyfails at gmail.com or message me on Facebook. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram as Bedtime Fairy Fails and Twitter as BT Fairy Fails. 